forget the Orient Express. There's been a murder on Aberystwyth Pier. The starlings are being picked off one by one. There are four suspects, all with means and motive. The tawny owl, the barn owl, the dashing sparrowhawk, and the speedy peregrine falcon. Who's the killer on the coast? Find out on Winter Watch. Hello and welcome to Winter Watch 2021. We are in our second week. I hope you've had a good day. I hope you had a very good day. If you've had a very good day, it's about to get very much better. We've got some super wildlife to bring you today. Yes, there's been a murder and also I've got a fantastically romantic story to tell you in a moment about starlings. Our theme today though is seasonal gatherings. All of those animals, plants and organisms that come together at this time of year. So what better way to start than with a microscopic gathering of frost crystals. Look at this. This photograph was taken by Matt Doog. It was on top of a balustrade just outside of his back door. It's frost, highly magnified. In fact, he's taken 37 different pictures and he stacked them all together. And it's exquisitely beautiful. Just look at the structures and colours there. Quite a gathering. Another gathering was spotted, quite literally, by Mike Hoyt. Look at this, a frosty post is home to all of these ladybirds. Absolutely masses of them, 16 spotted ladybirds. There were 1,200, which means 19,200 spots on that post. Fantastic stuff indeed, really, really good. Well, all of those things are gathered together, but we presenters are very definitely not. We're adhering to all of those guidelines and we're spaced around the country very close to our homes. And for that reason, Yolo Williams is over in central Wales at the Centre for Alternative Technology. Yolo. I am indeed, Chris, and it will shock absolutely no one to know that um once again, it is absolutely pouring down here. But you know what? It doesn't matter because we have a wealth of wildlife for you tonight. Now, winter gatherings is the theme. I have a gathering for you. Not a huge gathering, a rather small gathering, but it's all about quality, not quantity. These are turnstones taken by Jeff and Anne Cohen on Llandilas Beach up in North Wales. Now, these birds gather not in huge numbers, but in smaller flocks. And they're called turnstones because that's what they do. They turn stones over and they turn bits of seaweed over looking for invertebrate food cracking little birds they really are and later on i'm going to be looking at another wader unfortunately one that's in decline now that's the curlew and i'll also be looking at the otters up on the river ness in scotland but for now let's go down to cornwall to gilliard Thanks, Yolo. Thanks, Yolo. Gosh, those turnstones are lovely. We see them around the coastline here as well, of course. But how about this for a winter gathering? Now, this, these, I should say, are barnacle geese. These were filmed in Calabaric by Alison Hitchings. Now, they are some of the smallest geese, just over, well, just under half a meter, but they certainly gather in large numbers. They'll be here overwintering from their breeding grounds in the Arctic islands of Greenland and Svalbard. And later on in the program, we're going to be finding out how it was once thought that these geese originated from a crustacean. Can you believe that? And of course, we're also going to be catching up with our beaver family who have also been gathering. And Chris, I wonder if there is a collective noun for a gathering of beavers. Collective noun for a gathering of beavers. I don't know of one but then that doesn't stop us from inventing one of course you can always be the first to come up with that great to see all of those people out there snapping the wildlife filming the wildlife that they're spotting at this time of year do go on to our website where we have our winter watch list we've set you a bit of a challenge there each one of them is graded from easy through to hard and very hard indeed 
do rise to that challenge if you are out and about and uh, send us those pictures all the usual places twitter instagram and facebook of course now you know what we get up to on the watches we've always got live remote cameras non-intrusively watching our wildlife so that we can stick our nose into its lot into its lives um, let's take a look at the cameras we've got at the moment um, we've got some in the new forest oh look in the middle what have we got there let's cut live to that one that's one of our forest cameras Oh, lovely, look at that, little wood mouse. And listen to the rain. Pitter pattering on the top of the log, has found himself some shelter and a wealth of peanuts. Oh, well, found himself some shelter, but in some trouble. As a bigger, tougher, more argumentative mouse stormed in and knocked him out. That's the way of the world, isn't it? That's the way of the world. Let's go back to that nine way again, if we can, because there is another camera that I'd like to show you. Oh, we've got it here, actually. This is it. I was going to say, let's go beneath the pier in Aberystwyth, where our starlings have gathered for the evening. See the waves behind them here? A little bit of twittering going on, but a lot of lovely, happy, slumbering starlings. That's lovely. I like that a lot, actually. Of course, we have been watching them arrive, and they do a bit of murmurating in the sky before they swoop down under that pier to find some shelter and some warmth and also, essentially, to communicate with one another. And they're very, very vocal when they first get down underneath that pier. Just have a listen to them once they settle on those girders. I love that. I love that sound. And, of course, they wouldn't be making that sound if there weren't a reason for it. There's, you know, nothing exists in nature if there's not a reason. They're talking to one another. The question is, what are they saying? Unfortunately, no one that I know of can speak starling. We suspect that they're socially cohesing, they're socialising with those calls. They might be sorting out their hierarchies. They might be talking to one another about how good a day they have had or haven't had when it comes to foraging, but there will be a purpose to it. But we've been listening very intently to those starlings beneath the pier, and we've noticed something else that they're famed to do, and that is mimic other birds. And one of the birds we've heard the mimicking is this it's the blackbird now refresh your memories when it comes to blackbird's song it's delightful isn't it be coming soon it will stop raining the days will get longer spring will arrive and you will hear these birds singing from the top of tv aerials the length and breadth of britain very beautiful song but now let's go back beneath the pier and listen very carefully amongst the clamor of starlings listen for the blackbird Did you hear it? It wasn't a whole song, it was just a few notes, but it was undeniably a starling mimicking a blackbird. Why would they do that? Well, come to the breeding season, we know that females prefer males that sing the longest songs with the most units, and of course they can enhance the number of units that they're singing by mimicking other birds. So you frequently hear them doing that, but not just birds, actually they will mimic man-made songs as well. And this brings me to that romantic thing. I heard this story about an old two-stroke engine that was up on the Isle of Col off the western side of Scotland. And it lies in a field, and it's all rusty and overgrown. It hasn't puffed any smoke or made any sound for many years. And yet, the local starlings still mimic the call of that engine. How can that be? Well, it's because they don't just copy things they hear themselves, they also copy things that other starlings are mimicking. So in that case, younger starlings have mimicked the older ones. And what I love is that that rusty old motor has an acoustic memory that's maintained by birds. Oh, come on. That's glorious, isn't it? But what about the murder? What about the... Oh, yeah, the other things they do, they might actually be singing and communicating to one another. That might be beneficial to them, but they're not always very friendly when it comes to life under the pier. Look at this. They do squeeze themselves together to stay warm, and we know that the closer they huddle, the greater the chance there is that they will get through the night and get through the season. So huddling's important. But look at this. So is pecking one another by the looks of it. They're very argumentative, and these bouts of fighting break out throughout the course of the night. What's interesting is that the nearest neighbours seem to be able to block their ears and just completely ignore it. Look at that. 
Fantastic stuff. But what about that murder? What about that murder? Yes, there's been predation beneath the pier, and the suspects were Tawny Owl, Barn Owl, Sparrowhawk and Peregrine. What do you think? Who do you think the culprit is? Here's the answer, and it will surprise you. Yes, it's a Barn Owl in the middle of Aberystwyth, beneath the pier. It came in last night. Now remember, it's pitch black down there. We're using infrared light, so those starlings probably can't see the owl, but it's seen one of them. It swoops down the gangway and grabs a starling in the dark. A few of the others are panicking, but it's generally quiet. You have to look carefully to see it down there. It's in an enormous pile of starling poo. Not the place that you'd want to eat your supper. But it doesn't wait too long until it's dispatched the starling. And then a few of the others get a bit freaky when it's clearly moving. Maybe they can hear it when it's on the ground, scrabbling around. And then it peeps up, look here, and you can see the starling in its beak. There. And then, because we paid it 20 quid, it flies right down the gangplank and past our camera. Thank you very much, Barn Owl. What about that? Now, we have seen Barn Owls predating starlings at their roosts before. At Leighton Moss, a few years ago, they were doing that, but that was in a reed bed out in a rural area. This is the middle of a town. What's a Barn Owl doing there? Well, let's have a look at the middle of that town. I'm afraid there's quite a lot of rain on my map here. But here is Aberystwyth, and here is the pier here, and you can see the urban conurbations reaching all the way around here. So any Barn Owl would have to come in from the countryside here. And I spoke to Yolo a little earlier today and he knows this area and he told me that it's probably come from some rough meadows to the south side of the town here and that could be a distance of somewhere between half a mile and a mile so essentially this barn owl is commuting to the pier to get its meal what about that a commuting restaurant there for the barn owl fantastic stuff and something that we wouldn't have seen without our remote cameras Moving on, Samuel West is an actor you might have heard of. He's got a long and distinguished filmography, TVography. He's been in all sorts of TV series, Foils War, Doctor Who, most recently, All Creatures Great and Small. But you may not know that he's also a very keen naturalist, a keen birder, and he frequently visits that fabulous RSPB reserve, Minsmere. Well, in December, prior to lockdown, so, and socially distancing, he went out with our wildlife sound recordist, Gary Moore, to take another look, or rather, another listen, at Minsmere. Minsmere is a very special place to me. It's so varied in its habitats. I've seen some wonderful rarities here, but also the cast of ordinary birds that you can enjoy. I love spending a full day here, getting here just before sunrise, or even earlier sometimes, and staying until the birds roost at night. Hello. Hi, Sam. Hi, great to meet you again. And you too? What are you up to? Okay, we've got a group of feeders, and if you pop those cams on, look, okay. Sam, and there's a little receiver there that have all been sterilized. I've actually put a radio mic behind that upright. So here we go, if I fade that up. Oh yes. Yes, amazing. That's a whole new sound world. I've never heard that before. These are binoculars for ears. And suddenly everything over there is as close as, as binoculars bring the picture. It's amazing. Really remarkable. Hearing them for the first time landing, how much bigger a great tit is than a blue tit. It's like twice the volume. There's just a greater mass of bird. Female great spot, look, she's on there, look, oh, look, yeah. look, look, look. Female great spot woodpecker. This is amazing. Listen to that. That's 
there's a lot of force behind that. You, I never sensed that before. Yeah, terrific. Bit of a brute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the tank has left. Now, let's go down to the reed bed on the edge of the wood. The reed bed is one of Minsmere's richest habitats, but this fantastic shelter can make it almost impossible for us to know what's where. So I hope with the help of Gary and the power of sound, I'll be able to see into the reeds. I've got my parabolic reflector. It just allows me to hoover up sounds and calls and birds that are basically tucked away in the reed bed. I always get kids, look, if just, why don't you just do that? Yes. Cup, cup your hands it makes a real ears. difference, doesn't it? And then you point it to yeah. where... And I say, that's basically that's how this works. One of those. You can hear the texture of the wind on the, re on the reeds, and almost like you can see it. It's very relaxing, actually. I often close my eyes and just let the parabolic do the work. I don't need to see. No. It will pick them out. Oh, that was a water rail, wasn't it? It's not doing that full-on pig squeal. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> just, just contact call. Still counts, though. It does. Some mutes. <laughs> so we've done the woodland, we've done the reed bed. Let's go and check out the scrape for a totally different soundscape. Excellent. This is my Minsmere happy place, plenty of ducks. I think ducks might be my spirit animal. I'd love to have their flamboyant plumage and that boisterous behavior. Today, though, they're keeping their distance. And it's down to Gary's mic to pick out the star performance. Oh, we got some mallards. Oh, yes. Yeah. There we are. Are those widgeon contact calls, yeah. those high whistles? Yeah. They are. And it's really quite far carrying. Hunting shovelers. Oh, yeah, look, there's a male and female in the circle. Yeah. It's like they've lost something. Yes, <laughs> looking for the contact lens. Oh, it was here. Yeah. No, it was here. I told you not to put that down That's there. That's my wedding ring. <laughs> I must say, it's really opened my ears today. I've so enjoyed it. It's like been a completely different perspective. It's an unusual twist on the everyday bird. I think that's probably what it is. I like it very much. An unusual twist on the everyday, just like Gary says, and that's what we're doing here tonight at Cornwall Beaver Project. We are using a thermal imaging camera to get an unusual view on the nocturnal comings and goings of all the creatures around the beaver pond. Now, a few days ago, this is what we saw. There's some familiars, some surprises here, but there was a whole host of characters, which started with the kingfisher. This was filmed just as it was getting dark at about 5 p.m., so eking out the very last of the daylight to hunt there. Also saw mallard. These were active along with the moorhen. They both were active right up until about 10 p.m. But this was the surprise, at least for me, a heron out at night. Now, I used my phone a friend option as well. I called Yolo to find out if this was unusual. And Yolo reckons that, especially down here in Cornwall, where we're very far south of these mild winters, amphibians may already be starting to become active. So the herons will be out at night starting to make use of that food source. So that was pretty amazing, but this was even more amazing. We got our first glance ever of a group of the beavers. Now, this was four of the beaver families. Now, just to remind you, there are seven beavers in the enclosure. Two adults, there's two juveniles, and three kits that were born last spring. And so we are looking at three of the kits there. And one of them swims around, 
to what we presume is a mother, could be the father as well, very difficult to tell them apart, unless of course the female's lactating. And they're so tender, this tender little moment of grooming. Now they're grooming each other. This is called aloe grooming. We've heard Chris and Megs talk a lot about aloe grooming with the badgers, and now we see it with the beavers. And this is really, really important, not just to get to those hard to reach places, but also because this is how they reaffirm their social bonds. They're really, really social animals. But it's not just about bonding. They also need to keep their fur in good working order. These are aquatic animals. They are active right throughout the winter. And that would make sense. Their fur is absolutely vital to keep them warm. So they have a tool for the job or several tools for the job. And I have a tool for the job as well because the Trevor the Beaver is back. He's had so many, so many appearances now on the watches and still going strong. Now I like Trevor because he gets to show what I like to call the multi-tool of the animal world. Now he's got several features like all beavers of course which make them really exquisitely adapted for their aquatic lifestyle. So let's just take a look at a couple here. So at the back here is the tail. Now this is used for propulsion. It's also used as a rudder and also a, fan, uh, a fat store for the winter. Now let's move round to these large webbed feet as you would I'm sure guess those are for propulsion but there is a little feature tucked away on one of the inner claws that I wanted to show you now this here is called the split claw now this is a little bit of a misnomer because it's not a split nail the top half is the actual claw and the bottom half is a horny growth now what the beaver does with this is it use it as a fine tooth comb and it will draw the hair between that tiny little gap and it'll use it to comb out all the debris from its fur coat. Now we got this footage, it's quite exceptional, of one of the beavers down in the enclosure a few nights ago using its split claw exactly like that. Now you can see it there scratching away, but what's really extraordinary is you can see the claw there as it's using it to groom, but it's glowing white. And what this is, is an indication that this has got a high blood supply, lots of blood vessels there, loads of nerves, and that would suggest exactly how important the, this split claw is and grooming is for these animals. So they use it to take the debris out, but also there's another little trick, well, not quite up their sleeves, but what they do is they adopt, when they're grooming, a very classic grooming posture. They'll sit up on their, backsides with their tail tucked underneath and they use those little front claws to reach down into a cloacal opening where there is an anal gland and there is a special oily secretion and they'll use the front paws to retrieve that secretion out those oils and rub it over the fur and then it uses that split claw to comb it through to condition to waterproof their fur so all those amazing, exquisite little features to help them stay warm in the winter as they groom. So for one well-groomed animal to another well-groomed individual in Wales, and it's Yolo. Yeah, you are joking, aren't you, Gillian? It is pouring down with rain here. You know what? When we started Winter Watch, I was six foot six. Look at me now, four foot two and still shrinking. Now, over the last few days, we've been seeing a lot of our otters up on the River Ness. And actually, when we came here to the Centre for Alternative Technology for Autumn Watch, they were just beginning to plan the building of an artificial otter halt. Two weeks ago, it was nearly completed. So I went along just to provide the finishing touches. Now, the foreman, Rob Goodsell, he's the woodland manager here. He'd seen signs of otters nearby, but hadn't actually seen any potential halt site. So he thought he would build an artificial halt. That's him and me just putting a few logs on the roof. And below that is the chamber, the central chamber. That's where they're hoping the otters will come in. They'll rest up. And who knows, they may even breed in there. Then we planted a few willow. And of course, eventually the bramble will come in and cover all of that. There were two tunnels as well leading from that into the river, one onto the shore and the other one into the water itself. And that's in case they get a, a mammal predator, let's say a badger digging its way in. If there are youngsters in there, they can escape into the water then. So from a potential otter site to somewhere where we know we've got otters, the River Ness 
up in the highlands of Scotland. This is the river that flows from Loch Ness in a northeasterly direction and empties out into the Murray Firth up there. It's a beautiful area, stunning area. And we have a couple of cameramen up there, Lindsay and Al, who've been filming and setting up remote cameras and tracking the otters. And they've tracked them to this, a temporary halt in the river bank in those big rocks in there. It's a typical otter halt. I say temporary because they're certain to move on sometime. I've seen otter halts under tree roots. I've seen them in small caves. I even saw one under an upturned boat once. Now the cubs, they're still visibly smaller than the female. So they're probably not quite a year old yet. And they become independent when they're around, probably around 14 months old. So they've got a bit to go yet. And it's really important for those cubs to make the most of the time they have left with the mother, because they need to learn the skills of survival. They need to learn to look after their fur. That's gonna save them on these cold winter nights. And critically, they need to learn how to feed. Because when they leave, when they disperse, well, high mortality rates occur in these otters. So more they, the more they learn now, the better prepared they'll be. If you're watching yesterday, Chris showed us a clip of one of the cubs emitting a high-pitched contact call. Let's have a listen to that again. Now, this happens when they're left on their own, they become isolated. Just listen. See that squeaking? Very, very high-pitched squeak there. They use that to keep in touch with the mother. They use that to keep in touch with the other cub as well. And this will happen more and more as time goes on. The mother will leave them for longer periods, just preparing for that time when they have to uh, head out into the wild blue yonder by themselves. Now, our cameraman up there, Lindsay, has a hypothesis. He reckons that they emit that high-pitched squeal because that pitch carries further over flowing water than any other sound. And do you know what? I think he's right. If you think about it, kingfishers, you usually hear them before you see them. You get a flash of blue and orange and it's gone. But they emit this repeated, high-pitched, very brief whistle. And that carries a long way. And I reckon that's why these otters have this high-pitched squeak. So, Lindsay, well done. Great theory, mate. Fantastic. Now, if you're watching yesterday, you have seen Megan extol the virtues of the brown rat. Many of you said you loved rats. Even more said you hate rats. Well, Megan tonight is defending another group of animals that not many people like, and I've even heard one or two call them rats of the sea. She's looking at jellyfish. The ethereal world of jellyfish. Beautiful, enchanting creatures that are typically found drifting through our oceans. Of the 200 known species of jellyfish, our UK waters are home to only six of them. Horsey Lake is one of very few places in the UK to have a breeding population of jellyfish all year round, allowing me the opportunity to get up close and personal to our most abundant jellyfish in winter, Aurelia urita, or moon jellyfish. I couldn't resist. Now, I'm in a dry suit, not because I'm worried about being stung, but because I'm free diving in the middle of winter. So it's hopefully it's gonna keep me nice and warm. Fingers crossed. You can really see why they're called moon jellyfish. It's because in their translucent bells, they've got these four white crescents, very distinctly aptly named. I think they're absolutely beautiful. But this species has one surprise. Humans can't feel their sting. And I feel so confident in the water with these, that I've actually taken my glove off. And I can scoop my hand around them. And I am totally fine. I don't feel a single thing. 
Now there are jellyfish in our waters that do sting, from the impressive barrel jellyfish, whose sting is weak and harmless, to the rarer lion's mane jellyfish. With tentacles up to 30 meters in length, it is a colossus. And if you're unlucky enough to be stunned by one, it can be very painful indeed. So perhaps it's easy to see why jellyfish have got a bad reputation, but can we ever learn to love them? To find out more about these seemingly extraterrestrial organisms, I've come to the University of Southampton's National Oceanic Centre to meet Alex Loveridge, a PhD student who's been studying these curious creatures and is keen to show that there's more to them than meets the eye. Alex, jellyfish. I mean, I know they're not really fish. They don't have gills, they don't swim around like fish do. But what exactly are they? Well, they're invertebrates, which means that they don't have a spine, no bones to speak of as such. They're about 95% water, so they really are jelly. <laughs> so in terms of their anatomy then, because they don't have a brain and they don't have a broad nervous system, so how do they react to stimuli? How do they know where to go, what to eat, where to find food? Yeah, they don't have a nerve system that you and I have, but they do have a nerve net which helps them control where they're going, helps them find prey and helps them to respond to stimuli. So if they bump into a rock, they know not to swim in that direction. And some jellyfish also have very simple eyes so they can tell light from dark. And in some cases, for a few species, different colors. They can differentiate color. Mm. Can they? That's amazing, isn't it? And it, I love you know this group of animals because they play such an important function within the oceanic ecosystem too. Jellyfish play a number of important roles. So they provide nurseries to juvenile fish so that might be hiding from bigger predators. Also, after these big aggregation events called jellyfish blooms, all of those jellyfish will die and sink to the bottom and will take carbon out from the upper layers of the ocean down into the deep ocean and provide food for those animals that are down there. Not only do they provide food and sanctuary for many marine species, but their ability to trap carbon dioxide has kept harmful greenhouse gases from entering our atmosphere. And when you consider that jellyfish have been providing these vital roles for more than 500 million years, making them the earliest known swimming animals and at least two times older than the earliest dinosaurs, it's a testament to the part that they play in keeping our ecosystems thriving. So next time you come across one of these amazing animals, do be vigilant, but also take the time to appreciate their incredible anatomy, their importance to marine biodiversity, and of course, their serene beauty. Stunning. Beautiful animals. Absolutely stunning. Like you said, yeah. they're almost extraterrestrial. Their body form is so alien from ours, you can barely believe we're sharing the planet at the same time. They're incredible. They're stunning to watch. Therapeutic to watch, in a way, yeah. without yeah. rippling around. And so misunderstood, I think. I love to see them myself. But, of course, a lot of people are fearful of them because the fact that they do sting. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to go over exactly how they do sting. So each tentacle has something called a nematocyst on it. Depending on the species, it can have up to 5,000 of these stinging cells, the nematocysts. But they are pretty fantastic in the way that they work, and I've got a bit of a demonstration. Demonstration, give me those. Yeah, go on. Can you hold that up for me? All you need is a biodegradable balloon, right. a ping pong ball, yeah. and some tin foil spears. I've always got those handy. You do, yeah. So the balloon represents this hollow tubule that the um, tentacles have. And then these are the barbs here. And what I have to do to demonstrate is I have to wrap the barbs around the stinging cell. Mm. Bear with me on this one. Mm. Mm. Are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, well, no. It's, a, it's quite fiddly it's in the wet, to be It's fair. quite fiddly in the wet, if mm. I'm honest with in you. In the pouring rain. It's a bit of a struggle, but it is worth the wait. Yeah. Are you ready? OK, yeah, go on. so... Okay. <laughs> I can do the balloon. Well, you can do it. You can muster the breath. You've been talking all day. I've heard nothing but hot air. <laughs> there we go. So now my stinging cell is set up, and what happens when the hydrostatic pressure changes within the tentacle here? Right. What happens? It propels itself forward like this. Okay, you ready? go on, yeah. Just like that. Just like that. Just like that. That 
it's one of the best demonstrations you've ever seen on the watches, isn't it? This, this series has a long legacy of some of the most remarkable demonstrations made from kitchen objects and, and things like that. I tell, well, let's, let's see it again. Come on, let's just see this demonstration again. Come on, let's have a look at it. Oh, actually, in slow there motion, it's not as bad. In slow motion, it does the job. <laughs> OK. It does. Oh, I take back everything I said. Thank you. It was brilliant. Thank well you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> but there has also been some records of a new species that's turning up along UK shoreline, something that we haven't seen very much. This is the Portuguese man o war. It's a fantastic animal there. You can see it here. It's incredible. And uh, research at the College Cork University has found that these mass strandings are massively increased since 2016. And what you can see there is the animal, and it's on a bed of kelp. And what's amazing about these animals is that they're something called siphonophores. So what you're seeing there isn't the entire animal. What you're seeing there is a functioning part of an animal. And collectively, they make an entire uh, organism together. So some of those might do digestion, some of them might feed, some of them might be responsible for moving, locomotion, and together... Different species making a composite animal. They, they make a composite animal Amazing all together. One giant organism made from small And pieces. that bit that we were looking at there, that's the sail. Yes. Essentially that floats on the surface and the wind blows that so that they can move from mm. one place to another. And those mass strandings yeah. you mentioned, there's been an increase in those since yeah. 2016. There have been huge numbers of these Portuguese man wars seen on Irish beaches. Mass of them. They're not jellyfish at all. They're sophonophores, which is incredible and often mistaken for jellyfish. But with the increase of these man wars what we have seen is also an increase of another species. Now, this is very special. Let's have a look at this. This is very special. This is the violet bubble snail. Give that to me. Go on. No, come on. Be gentle with it. Okay. okay. Be gentle with it. It's very delicate and incredibly Look lightweight. Look at that. That's because it's this pelagic species, and what it does is it floats around in the ocean currents. And what it will do then is, when it finds jellyfish or man o' war, it will latch onto them because that's exactly how it feeds. It eats jellyfish and man o' war, but it's a beautiful beautiful animal there so delicate it's stunning that gorgeous violet color that gives it its name as well and of course the most amazing thing is how it breathes have a look at this it's not called the bubble snail for nothing it produces this mucus out of the foot at the bottom and what it does is it folds the mucus up and it's at the surface of the water to trap air bubbles there that enables it to go through the current and live underwater successfully and then when those bubbles pop, unfortunately for this beautiful snail, it sinks to the bottom and dies. So it's incredibly reliant on those bubbles to survive. That is absolutely amazing. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I, I may have to retain this for my collection. No, we borrowed it from the uh, Isle of Scilly's Wildlife Trust, but um, it might get lost in the post on the way back. Oh, but what about that? Amazing, I mean, look, come on, come on. You've got a composite animal made up of different species of organisms that perform as a mutual whole that's being predated by a snail that spins bubbles out of its bottom and then floats <laughs> around on the surface of the sea until it blows into the jellyfish and then it punctures it with a really sharp tongue and eats it. Ladies it's and gentlemen, cool. that's what you pay your licence fee for. It's your catchphrase, isn't it, that one? <laughs> oh, what a thing that is. What a Come thing in. that is. We better move on. And... Yeah. Oh, hold on. I'm just, I'm putting it safely okay. away. Right, yeah, right. yeah. Let's rejoin <laughs> Gillian down in Cornwall. She's on the trail of a beach combed item with a myth behind it that goes back many, many years. <laughs> I, I, I've just got to stop and say it was Megan's demo for me. I love jellyfish, but that was just a classic. But yes, of course, we are staying with the maritime theme. And we're looking at another wonderful way to explore what lives under the sea, but by never getting wet. This is by looking at the shore and seeing what's brought in by the tide, but also by winter storms. And there's some really curious things, but I reckon this has got to be a contender for one of the most curious creatures or gatherings of creatures that you'll see. Now this was photographed on the Isles of Scilly and this is a whole tree trunk that was washed ashore, brought ashore by the tide or maybe by a winter storm and it's covered with goose barnacles. Now let's take a closer look at these just to see what these are. Now these are actually relatives of crabs and lobsters, they're crustaceans 
and you can see these kind of bivalve shell shapes, but it's much more complex like that. So what we've done is we've brought some preserved specimens here for you to get an even closer look at just how amazing and curious these things are. So we've got some preserved specimens here. Now there is that sort of bivalve shaped sh shell that we saw, but what this is, is in fact is five separate plates that make up the covering around the actual animal which is then attached via this long fleshy stem which is black in the living animal to a substrate so that might be rock that might be a tree or some driftwood I should say and so that's what they look like and that appearance has caused quite a lot of confusion in the past so their Latin name is Lepus anatifera which means bearer of ducklings and this is how the story goes in about the 1200s, a pair of barnacle geese arrived on the shores of Britain. Nobody knew about their migratory behavior. So they figured that these goose barnacles must have come from somewhere unusual. So let's take a look at the, how, how this confusion came about. So the goose barnacle there and the barnacle geese, well, people looked at those and thought they looked quite similar. They put two and two together and figured that the goose barnacle must have hatched out from the barnacle geese. All very confusing, as you can imagine. But the story of the name of these things is pretty strange. Their lifestyle is even stranger than any folklore. Now, the barnacle geese, or the goose barnacles, you see how this gets confusing. <laughs> They are larvae, when they're small, they have these free-swimming planktonic larvae, but they will settle down onto the seabed, onto rock, onto whatever substrate they can. And that's when they attach and form the adult stage of their life cycle. So that's what we see washed ashore. Now let's take a look at how these actually feed, even though they're sedentary animals. So the barnacles will push out legs. These are called cirri. And these are actually stranded animals out in, on dry land, but in the water they will rake those cirri and they will filter out food particles, plankton, that are then passed down via some very small hairs called seti down into the animal that is hidden away in that shell. And that is how they feed. Now we've had a number of these curious, curious creatures arrive on the shores right through the winter loads of you or at least some of you have been seeing this and sent these photos in so let's just take a look because this actually goes to show that they don't just attach on natural things they also attach pretty much on anything they can here's an aerosol saw, um, can but there is also another photo here sent in where you can see they're attached to what looks like a shoe now obviously we don't like to see these unnatural objects floating around the ocean but it does go to show that they can make the most of what is available and there you see them on a handle of a bucket so if you are out and about and your daily exercise if you're lucky enough where beach combing can feature in your daily exercise then keep an eye out for these things they're absolutely amazing but keep an eye out for all sorts of wonderful wildlife as well and we would love it if you could photograph them video them and send them to us using the winter watch list hashtag and I know someone else who's been keeping an eye out for wildlife and that's Yolo in mid Wales who's been following a very evocative bird I'm still here. I haven't moved very far. Gillian's still standing in the rain. And do you know what? The other day I was thinking, only once have I ever left mid Wales and Wales for any length of time. And that was to go down to college in London in the early 1980s. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I had a great time. Just, well, there were no mobile phones around then. But there were a few things I missed about the Welsh countryside. And do you know what I missed most of all? It was this bird. It was the curlew, Europe's biggest wader. One of our most distinctive birds with that long down curve bill. It's a real iconic species. And I tell you when I missed it most of all was in early spring, in early April, when I'd go with my little dog, Bitter. We'd go up onto the hills, onto the moors, and we'd hear the evocative call of the curlew, that long, beautiful, bubbling song that they've got. And it's when I heard that that I knew spring had arrived. I really miss that. And unfortunately, 
globally they're in decline, but in Wales they're in serious decline. I know I was working for the RSPB in the late 1980s, we carried out various surveys and in those days we estimated we had roughly 11,500 breeding pairs in Wales. Now it's nearer 400 pairs. Now in winter they tend to head down to the coast, to the intertidal zone. And not just the Welsh birds, we know that we get birds from further north in the UK, we get birds from continental Europe, particularly Scandinavia. And they come here for the mild winter and they come here too, of course, to um, exploit the food source. These intertidal areas are hugely important for them. Now these days we hear a lot about changing weather patterns and about sea level rise. How is that going to affect our curlew? Well, a project has begun. It's an interreg funded one that's carried out in Ireland and Wales in association, in association with the British Trust for Ornithology and in Wales it's centred on Anglesey. It's called the Anglesey Curlew Project, and in particular on one estuary in the southwest called the Kevney Estuary. It's not a big estuary, but when the tide goes out, vast areas of sand and mud are exposed, and the curlews take advantage of this. They are, of course, a long legged, a long beaked bird. And what they do is they probe in the sand, they probe in the mud, and they're looking for lugworms, they're looking for ragworms, they're looking for the invertebrates that often, a lot of the other birds, simply cannot reach in there. Look at that, straight in. It's got a very sensitive end of that bill. They can feel these invertebrates down there feeding on that so it's a really important area but before you find out how sea level rise if it covers these areas how it's going to affect the curlew first you need to know where the curlews are feeding where the important areas are and to do that in November 2020 the scientists caught six curlew and attached satellite transmitters onto their backs. You see them there. Now these are small, they're very light, they don't harm the birds at all. They sit on the back, they don't interfere with flight, they don't interfere with feeding and they don't interfere with the walking bird in any way or form. And of course we get a great deal of information back from that too. So what do we know? Well have a look at this particular bird. This bird is doing what the scientists thought it would do. It's staying more or less in that estuarine area there. See that it's feeding out on the sandbanks, on the mud banks. It's also feeding on the south shore, on the right-hand side. There's an area of salt marsh there. That's going to be a pretty good feeding area. Every now and again, it does go over the sea wall, over Mastrite Cobb, and feeds on some of those very wet fields there. This, as I say, is what the scientists expected. But have a look at this bird. This is a different bird, and this one has been very, very different. Yes, it spent some time on the estuary. It's actually gone up the Kevney River there to the right, up as far as the RSPB's course the Gau, or Mastrite Marsh Reserve, and it's also headed four kilometres inland and targeted just a handful of wet fields there. Now the scientists weren't expecting this at all and partly because when it went inland, it went inland only at night. So what was it doing on those wet fields? Well obviously it had found food there. It was probing in the grass again with that long long bill looking for earthworms. Now what we don't know is, is this just one bird? Do other birds do it? Is this an old experienced bird that's found a new food source to exploit? Is it one of the Scandinavian birds? Is it one of the Welsh birds? We simply don't know that. The other thing that we don't know yet is, if sea level does rise, does this mean that the curlews can actually change their behavior? They can abandon the estuaries because they have to and move inland to feed. This is the first year of four, so there's a lot to learn and at the end of four years the scientists are really hoping we'll have answers to a lot more of these questions. Chris and Meg, some fascinating new research there and a lot more to learn again of course.
Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it, Yolo? I mean, you're learning so much all of the time. And of course, technology these days is really helping us get a closer insight into these animals' populations to figure out how they're doing. But it also enables us to have a good look at their behaviour too. And of course, we've rigged up our cameras everywhere. Let's have a little look at some of those. Here's all nine of them. Oh, what's We've that there? Look, top, what's that top, top left? left? Top left. That's one of our look new forest cameras. Isn't it? Oh, yes, look, badger. There we are. Here we are. Having a bit of a search for some earthworms there. It doesn't seem to be worrying quite so much about the rain as me and you, Beast. No, not at all. It's got a gorgeous... Oh, hold on, the fox. And fox, fox. Foxes, come, foxes come in oh, as well, look. look. That. Oh, a little Ooh. bit of marking there. Did you see that? Yeah, a little Did bit of marking. Just spotted down and marked the food. Badger is kind of puffing up. Look at the ears down. Look at the ears of the fox down. It's in quite a submissive pose compared to the badger. You see that now? Look. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, it's limpy. It's the limping it's the one limping, that we know. It's our limping, it's the limping fox. one that we know. Beautiful though. Amazing, isn't it? To see that. Normally badgers Fantastic are quite stuff. on top of foxes. So great. We've to been see. keeping a keen eye on our badgers though because we we've been watching them for a number of years, Megs and I. And we wanted to know this winter how many of the individuals that we've come to know as individuals are still in that set. Now, the easiest way to count them, of course, is if they were to all come out at the same time and line up. But, you know, with the best will in the world, that doesn't happen. So you've got to piece together the evidence that you've got by looking at them in different places at different times and also by recognising them. So you can count them here. Look, there's one, two, three, four, five. There's five badgers there, so you know you've got a minimum of five, of course. And then in this shot here, when they've been out in the field, there are, in fact, six. So we know you've got a minimum of six. But, of course, we see here that none of them are pale individuals. And we know that we have at least three pale individuals in our group. Two adults here, look, the boar on the left, and then the cub in the middle, the sow on the right. So that would take us up to nine. Let's just put all of those images together now so that we can do a little bit of maths. Because it's not just about those different colours, it's also about being able to recognise them as individuals. Because males and females are quite distinct, and even then, if you are able to look at them quite closely, you can tell a different male from another male. So here, when we put them all together, I reckon, having looked at all of the footage, that we're still looking at a family group in this area in the region of 12 to 14 animals which is pretty good. That's good. Yeah, because, you know, in years gone by, it was as low as six or seven. We've seen in a long-term study in Oxford that that number's increased to 12, and it counters badger behaviour on the continent. In Spain, groups of two, just pairs. And in other parts of Europe, maybe somewhere between two and three. So in the UK, they are a lot more social. And looking at them as individuals is something you can do yourself. Have a look at this. Here, look at these animals. So obviously the animal in the middle is a pale animal, so that's easy to distinguish. It's a pale female, actually, that one. I call her the golden sow. But if you look at the animal on the left and contrast it with the one on the right, the one on the right's got much smaller ears. And they've both got chubby cheeks, they're males, but again, they have distinguishing features. So if you do have badgers coming to your garden, or if you're watching these cameras, which you can do from 10 in the morning until 10 at night, you can identify those individuals which is mm. nice it's brilliant isn't it getting to know those individual characteristics but it's not only our badges that we've seen a bit of action from we've also seen a bit of avian action on our wood stump in our forest have a look at this so there's a few peanuts here so it's attracting in lots of different activity going on there now if you remember in the spring i said that the heaviest weight of the bird means often that it's the most dominant but during this time of year we see a bit of a surprise here here's a gorgeous nut hatch and the robin comes in you see the nut hatch is a bit nervous there but the nuthatch chases the robin off. It is a slightly larger bird. That cold it's not getting involved at all, is that it? That cold no, it's not. It's staying right on the outside. A bit of a wimp, the and the robin and flies in and flies back. Now, at this time of year, oh, and it's <laughs> robin goes off from a male great spot woodpecker there. But this is what's really amazing. So the robin's kind of checking out the, the great spot, has a bit of a go at it, keeps kind of flying threateningly towards it, but the great spot doesn't move until look at that wait a minute it keeps going until i mean it's a gutsy robin yes. until it goes off it does really unusual because of course the robin is much smaller than the great spotted woodpecker so it's incredible to see but they are incredibly gutsy at this time of year for very feisty keeping they those certainly are and singing driving other robins out of their territory we've got just yeah. about enough time i think to show you this in our little camera in the hedge we've got a bank foal in there small ears small eyes nibbling the nuts in the rain yeah. but then all of a sudden Chased a wood off. mouse comes in <laughs> 
chases the bank vole away. It doesn't surprise me. They're quite, well, they're much larger. They're much larger. Very different. Again, look, look at the big ears, big eyes, long tail, long tail. Easy to tell apart. But also, wood mice are quite carnivorous animals. Yeah, you can see them side by side here, so the obvious differences are the ears. Mouse has much, much larger ears, as Chris said, bigger eyes. Mouses have also got kind of a pointier snout as well, much more so than our filled vole too. So some yeah. distinguishing features there to look okay. out for. Give it a choice then. Things. Who would you go out with, a vole or a mouse? You know, I'd go vole. If I had to go out would with a vole, I'd go out with a vole. Yeah, why not? No, no, no. Big ears, big eyes. Time. It's the mouse for me. <laughs> This weekend, don't forget this weekend, when we finish, is a big weekend in the yeah. ornithological calendar. The RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch is on over the weekend, and you can find out plenty of information about that on our website. Now, it's time for our mindfulness moment. Most of these that we've shown you have been filmed in daylight, but this is a nocturnal one. Well, I say that, it's nocturnal, but we're using a very new piece of technology which will transform darkness into almost daylight to give us a remarkable view of what's going on. In this case, in North Somerset, it's absolutely divine. And look out for the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. Sea beams glistening off the shoulder of Orion. Absolutely magical. And I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. What's coming up tomorrow? Well, plenty more wildlife action. After doing jellyfish justice today, Megs is out and about trying to make us feel better about pigeons. We will be looking at the power of water to soothe, calm and heal the mind with a dose of wild swimming. And we'll be keeping up with the drama underneath Aberystwyth Pier. Last night, it was murder. Tonight, who knows? Our theme tomorrow night is how nature makes us feel better. So don't miss that. We'll be on at 8 o'clock, of course. You can catch Megan and I at 1 o'clock. We'll be on Instagram Live with Hannah Stitfall. And don't forget, of course, those cameras. Despite the rain, those in the New Forest here are still paying dividend with all of those badgers that are out there. You can watch them from 10 till 10. And lastly, if you do get out tomorrow, your wildlife walks, hashtag wildlife watch list on the website. Do upload your photographs. We love looking at those. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook as well, of course. Other than that, if we can possibly dry off and I can rain in Megan and a jellyfish demonstration, we'll see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Good night. <laughs>